Hey, it's Mark Pedosa at the Land Geek, your favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And on this week's roundtable, we have almost all the usual suspects. We've got the technician, Eric Peterson. Eric, how are things? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. I've got shingles, so that's fun. Yeah, that's But fun. other than that, I've, and I've just, you know, Scott Bossman is giving that disapproving you know, you shouldn't say that HIPAA look, but that's okay. It's my own privacy. You self disclosed self disclosed that. I self disclosed it. That's not like you're fine. sharing. You're not sharing others' health information. We would you're never do your that. Own. We would never do which, that. Which, by the way, I've done. I admit it, and I, and, you know, for sure. Um, speaking of, dude, buddy, the nightcap OG Scott Bossman. Good to see you. Good to see you, Mark. We got the Zen Master. Breathe in the mailing. Breathe out the marketing. Mike Zeno. Mike, how are things? Doing great. Hopefully, I sound uh, okay to you all today. Some microphone adjustments. Yeah, you're okay. Um, we've got Taria putting in the reps. Harris. Taria, how are you? I'm doing well. I would ask how you're doing, but you have shingles, so. Yeah, I'm I'm hanging in there. It's not it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Um, it could be worse. And last but not least, Tate. I love it when you call me Big Papa Litchfield. You know, it'd be great, Tate, is if I could just look over your shoulder and watch you work. Go to langeek.com forward slash lots. Look over Tate's shoulder. It's fun. Tate, how are things? Things are good. Things are really good. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So we've got a. F we're gonna do a quick hit. Uh, round table question. So the first one is, does anyone buy land outside of the United States? Perhaps Costa Rica. I've heard about Costa Rican land. Perhaps mm, Belize, oceanfront land in Belize. Let's start with the technician, Eric Peterson. How about you? I have not purchased land outside of the U.S. Um, I think Have you that, thought about buying land outside of the U.S.? Has it ever even come a, in, into I, your, I mean, your thought here, process? I guess it sounds like a cool idea, right? Um, but I think there's so much land in the U.S. And I know how to do that and I know how to do it well. So... I don't know. Like, I just don't have a desire to go outside of the country. While, you know, if you think about it, yeah, it'd be cool to, you know, buy and sell property in Costa Rica or somewhere else. But there's, there's a whole nother learning curve and you have to understand all the local laws and, you know, the country and everything else. So um, I haven't done it. I don't currently have plans to do it, but um, I'm sure it's possible. It, yeah, it, it's it's possible. I mean, but I think you make a really good point. You know who I think would be argumentative about this? Just because I know how he is. He loves to just play devil's advocate. The Zen Master. Mike hey, Zeno. Devil's advocate. Mike, I, I, I could just see you and Laura, you know, spinning that globe. And being, Let's buy land here. Because we can. We did have because an opportunity. Was, we did have an opportunity, Mark. We met somebody with a whole bunch of land in Mexico and we were talking about it, but it just it was layer upon layer of just complexity, it seemed. Uh, right down to the point where if you were gonna use it, you you know, he knew the local tribe that had jurisdiction over it and he knew them well and it was like it was just uh, it just seemed still multi layered and uh, risky. I'm sure there's a lot of money to be made there. I'm sure that if you had the the knowledge, I think you'd have to have a nice, a solid legal team and people that really knew international law and all this stuff. So this, I'm sure there's money to be made there, but I always think of our business as the low-lying fruit, uh, the easy land deals, the easy purchases uh, where we can you know, record it online and own it within an hour and uh, on Simply File. So yeah, opted against that. And uh, like Eric said, I am not disagreeing with Eric. I agree with Eric. There's an there's overabundance of land right here in the USA. Low-lying fruit. The low-lying fruit. Um, dude, buddy, not a cap OG. 
Scott Bossman, you ever buy land outside the U.S.? You and Aaron ever go out on one of those cold winter nights and be like, wouldn't it be great to have land in some tropical area? Oh, I don't know. Arizona? Guatemala. Not Arizona. It's tropical Florida. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know, in, but in, in, inexpensive beachfront property is kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, I understand. I mean, it's an appealing thought. Um, not really my cup of tea because I just want to continue doing what's working for us. And you know, maybe we'll just get to the point where we can. Airbnb, some different beachfront property here, there, and everywhere once the kids are out of the house and we'll enjoy the geography of those places. But I mean, I, do, are those areas great investments? Probably. Like Mike said, though, there there are so many layers to it that I would want to be uh, sure of before I went into something like that. I think it would be helpful if I, you know, th there may be some people in our community, you know, maybe there's some bilingual people, something like that, who could negotiate those waters with more confidence, but, uh, that's not me. And at this point in time, anyway, now I'm across an opportunity. I might listen to it. I might, you know, contemplate whether or not it's a good thing, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I've never done it. I'm going to stick, stick to doing what I'm doing and, and stick with what's working. Okay. So that's three no's. I can just imagine Taria putting in the reps, Harris, you know, just daydreaming with Landon, after a hard workout and and just, you know, be like, you know what? Wouldn't it be great to have some beautiful land in Australia? Yes. Right? So we have thought about buying land in another country, but for personal use. We, we've never looked at it from the standpoint of buying to sell. Um, as part of, you know, our system um, and even buying it for personal use, there was a lot of red tape. Um, the locals were a little skeptical, you know, we're coming in, we're not local. Why do you want like it? It, it was too much. And that was just buying it for personal use. So I can't imagine the bureaucracy of trying to get it and then turn around and sell it. So, no, we've never looked into it. Outside. All right. Well, that yeah, that's four no's. I mean, Tate's a world traveler. So I have a feeling he's going to buck the trend here and be like, oh, by the way, I own, you know, land in this this province in China. I just haven't told anybody. Um, my, my opinion on the matter is invest in America and travel the world with profits. That's kind of how I view it. You know, invest here stateside. There's fewer barriers to jump through. And then use your profits to go play. And that's, that's the approach I take. I mean, I don't, I don't want to have to deal with that. And, uh, we have a good system set up in the U S right now for our team and for buying land stateside. And I'm not messing with it. I mean, I don't need to add extra layers of complexity. I'm not chasing deals. I love the beach. I love the ocean, but. I'm happy working where I am and, and vacationing in those places personally. Um, I think when I look at the businesses that I've created, the thing that I'm most proud of is the fact that they're boring. They're very predictable. And the minute I start adding, you know, language barriers and other things that might need to happen to the mix, we're not as profitable. We're not as productive and it's harder to outsource. So I'm staying away from it personally. Yeah, I feel like the question is is sort of like one of those scarcity mindset questions. Like there's billions of acres of land available in the United States, right? right? We trust our, well, most of us trust the government. They're not going to just take the land away from us, right? I mean, we've got a good history of this. Most other countries don't, especially when foreigners own land. Why Why would you take the the economic risk, the the currency risk, the government risk, the legal risks, when you've got such a big market here. So it's all no's all around. But let's go to the next question, which is, have you bought from a seller that lives outside the country? Eric Peterson. I think it's been a while, but I think we did um, one time 
Um, and, you know, it's when, when we scrub our list, we typically remove international addresses. Uh, sometimes they slip through by accident or sometimes uh, someone's moved out of the country and a relative or friend forwards the mail and they get it in Japan or wherever they might live. Um, and in those cases, if those deals do come back to us, um, yeah, I mean, we can buy from a seller who is overseas. That's It's not necessarily an issue. The, the hardest thing is that um, they've got to be able to notarize the documents. And typically that means either they're going to have to do it online, if that's allowable, or um, they're going to have to find a U.S. embassy and go there to, to notarize the documents. Assuming they can accomplish that, um, it's really no different than uh, doing a deal with, you know, someone in the country. Okay. But for your coaching clients, do you, do you recommend they mail internationally? No, we don't. Okay. Zen Master. Just Ever Canada. buy? Just, just Canada. 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 Yeah. Okay. So, so you mail to Canada. Canada. Yeah. Uh, probably because I didn't scrub them out. I typically would um, scrub out out of out of U.S. owners, but uh, they were in there and they responded, and we bought. So, other than that, no, I haven't bought from any other uh, people that live in any other countries. But I, yeah. So just Canada, and uh, you know, just haven't had a need to do that. Okay, dude, buddy. Matt Cap OG, Scott Bossman. Wait, Scott, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Yeah. I bought from two sellers in Canada. Uh, one was actually a fellow uh, land geek who was selling wholesale. Uh, and the other one, I, I did not mail to the list. Uh, back when I first started, I was just kind of on Craigslist uh, shopping for land or, or looking at what people had for sale. And I saw that this guy had a really what I thought was a steal and I emailed him and he happened to be from Canada. Uh, and, um, we, we took care of the deal quite easily. It wasn't, wasn't an issue. Uh, really, um, he was able to find a notary and, and he had done some other, uh, real estate transactions in the past and self closed those deals. So he, if I had any questions, he was a good resource for me, but no, we don't mail, uh, to inter international buyers. And I think, you know, the longer you're in this business, you may come across opportunities like that. And, and I would say, you know, um, definitely don't pass on those opportunities because, you know, with a little bit of research, I think you could, you could definitely find a good deal. Okay. So you, so you don't mind mailing internationally? No, I don't mail internationally, but I, if I come across an opportunity, I'm not going to You wouldn't pass on it. rule that out. Okay. Um, Taria, how about you? Uh, no, we definitely don't mail internationally. We ended up, I think, same situation as Eric, where someone must have forwarded our mail to someone internationally. And they reached out and we started looking into it, um, but they ended up um, not wanting to sell in the end. But we were going to do it. I mean, it, it was pretty straightforward outside of, you know, the notary. And we thought, sure, why not? But no, we haven't as of today. Okay. And, but you don't look for it. You're not mailing. No, we don't mail overseas. No. Okay. Um, so far, it's been a bunch of no's for the most part on this whole international thing. Um, but maybe Tate, again, is, you know, because he speaks so many different languages. Um, we don't target properties where they're where the owners live outside of the United States, but I've bought from plenty of people who targeted me or sent me a message or called us and said, hey, I'm interested in selling my property. I've done that a number of times. I'd do it again. You're just gonna wanna consult with somebody who knows the ins and outs of you know, what might be required in those countries. A notary is obviously the key to all of this. And depending on where the seller lives will determine how easy it is to complete the transaction. And if they're going to have to fly somewhere to get a, a notary stamp, that's going to most likely kill the deal. But, you know, I, I've done it. And um, yeah, it, it was a profitable move, but uh, just take a little extra work. Again, the reason we don't target 
people who live overseas is it adds an extra layer of complexity. We are keeping it simple over here. We don't need to do that. There's plenty of other properties where the residents live in the United States and they're happy to sell. So I'll do it, but it's not something we search or seek out. You know what money loves? Speed. 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 Um, on Valentine's Day, money sends speed a card because it loves it so much. <laughs> Final question. Okay. Final question. Does anyone sell land to international buyers? Technician, Eric Peterson. We have not. Um, we've definitely talked to some some potential buyers from overseas, but we've never closed a deal with um, an international buyer. All right. Zen Master. One time. One time. One, one time. And um, actually, that one time, Mark, was uh, a wholesale deal. And he ended up not liking it. And uh, I wanted uh, the refund to take it back. But now that I'm thinking of it, that was a disaster because it was in another country. And for him to get it notarized, it was just, it was just not, it was crazy. So actually, that would change my answer to the prior question that I did buy it technically outside the uh, Canada or the United States. But just that one take back was so, so much of a headache. Uh, I would never go through that again. Okay. Dude, buddy, Scott Bossman. Uh, one deal in the last six years, we sold to somebody uh, outside the U.S. in Mexico. Very straightforward. Um, but that was it. That was it. Um, Taria. Yep, we have um, two people in the UK. And I think the biggest thing was getting uh, an American based uh, checking account for Actum because they would not um, withdraw against um, an international account. So that was the only kind of nuance. But other than that, it was very straightforward. Okay, fantastic. Um, yeah. Which accent do you like better, Tria? British, Australian, or South African? South African. South African. Okay. With Australian at a, a close second. With Australian at a close second. Yeah. It's, fu it's funny because, you know, when Americans travel overseas, like no one's ever like, ah, we just want to hear you guys keep talking. Like whenever I talk to someone who's British or Australian or South African, I'm like just keep talking. It doesn't even matter what you say. I just like the sound of it. And they sound smarter. Like, like, right? Yeah. Even yeah. bad news. Like they can give you horrible news and you're like, oh, okay. Just yeah. Sounds, sounds better. Goes over better. Am I, am I the only one who's like this? Tate? I like uh, No, I mean, the accents definitely are nice. I was thinking, I got an idea. If you ever have to deliver somebody bad news, we should find somebody who we can you know, rent their time, you know, somebody from South Africa and be like, Hey, I need you to call Mike Zeno, let him know he's fired, but do it in a way. Bad example. You know, he, he's example. okay with it. Jeez. I know he's going to be upset with me, but just let him know, Hey, you're fired. Okay. And let him do it with love. You know, I think that, I think we are, we're onto something. Team. Is Tate sending some liberal messages on the round table. I don't understand. I'm a little anxious now. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I was watching uh, the third season of Masters of None, and I won't spoil it for you, but there's a scene where someone does have to give a, a character really bad news, and she does it in a Jamaican accent, and it is so comforting. I'm like, I'll tell you what, that's the way to go. Yeah. That was for sure the way to go. So that could be a little side business. How to deliver bad news. I like it. I, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm a buyer. But, but so, Tate, but have, you, have you sold land to international buyers? Yeah, we've sold land to uh, a number of different um, people in different countries. Um, I guess, you know, Mexico, the UK. Uh, we've sold some properties to the Middle East, uh, United Arab Emirates, and, and places like that. 
straightforward. It's uh, pretty much the same thing. So, you know, they'll, they'll tell you how they want to take uh, ownership. Traditionally, it's well, what I've seen is it's normally under a corporation or an LLC and you write up the deed, transfer the property, you know, obviously get paid beforehand and uh, all sales are final. All right. Well, I think this is a, a really good roundtable podcast. Not not a lot of depth to it because none of us really, you know, Following market and mail to yeah. We just we, we just like this our massive market and we just keep it simple. There's nothing wrong with being ambitiously lazy, right? Like keep it simple, for sure. But we're at that point in the podcast where we get to go to Taria putting in the reps Harris and ask her for her tip of the week a website, a resource, a book, something else actionable for the art of passive income listeners to go, improve their businesses, improve their lives. However, before we get to Tria's tip of the week, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce our sponsor this week, which is Flight School. Learn how the next 16 weeks can literally transform your life. Go up that mountain of land investing with Scott Todd. He's done it thousands of times, quickly, safely, and efficiently. And the best part is, it ain't going to cost you nothing. That tuition, you're going to make it back 180 days or less, guaranteed. Just show us that you're working the recipe. Schedule a call with Dude Buddy, Nightcap OG, Scott Bossman, or the Zen Master, Mike Zeno. Go to landgeek.com forward slash training. Schedule that call. I promise you, you will be thankful for it. All right. Taria, what is your tip of the week? So my tip of the week is actually something that I have have sticky notes in my bathroom, right? And so this is a sticky note that I have. And it says, take risk, ask big questions, don't be afraid to make mistakes. If you don't make mistakes, you're not reaching far enough. And it's something that I also try and convey to a lot of my coaching clients because they're kind of just getting started and their big thing is, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to make a mistake. I don't, you know, I'm afraid to market. What if I do it wrong? You know, I'm afraid make mistakes. I'd rather be make mistakes doing something than sit day doing nothing. So that's my tip. I love that tip. The biggest mistake is not taking action and not learning. Yep. Right? Um, wait, I, I, I want to write this down. So take, so take risks, ask big questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's a, what's an example of, of a big question that you've asked yourself lately? A big question I've asked myself. Oh, that is a good question. I don't know. I don't know. Eric, what's what's a what's a big question you you've asked yourself lately? I, I feel like that's that's a really good roundtable podcast. Is what are the big questions we should ask ourselves? How do we get more time with our friends and family, or what are the things that we should be eliminating from our lives? What should be our, on our not to do list, right? So are, are some some big questions, um, you know? How how do I want people to eulogize me? What are the, those types of things? Because I got shingles, I got to think about this stuff. I'm not gonna die. <laughs> Feel like it, Sharia. You know, but, but that is a big question is, okay, if I do die, how, how have I structured my business so that it can continue going on seamlessly? That's a big question. I mean, these, these are, I mean, you know, and that's the great thing about this business is it does give you that time to explore the bigger questions, um, you know, personally, professionally, spiritually, right, um, to do those things. So... I can see Tate's thinking like, what's what's a big question I'm thinking about? And I hope it's not, should I come to the next week's podcast? <laughs> no, I'll be here next week. Um, I don't know. There's some deep questions. I mean, a lot of the thoughts. And then the When I'm riding my bike, a lot of times I'm thinking about, you know, is this a task that I should be doing? I, I mean, more so does it make me money? And if not, do I enjoy it enough to continue to do it? Or if something were to happen to me, 
what's going to happen? What does that look like for, for the business, for the family? And I think we're set up correctly, but I know there's definitely some holes in it, right? Uh, a lot of those big questions. So I don't, I don't know, Mark, it's, uh, I guess, like you said, there's, there's different, you know, angles to that question. Are you looking at from a business perspective, from a personal perspective, from a spiritual perspective, you know, there's a lot to, a lot to digest there. Yeah. I mean, you know, the big question for me this summer is, should I go to Boston and eat raw kibbe with Mike Zeno? It's a big Absolutely. existential question. Eric, you would eat it? Raw kibbe? Oh, I don't know if I would eat it, but you should absolutely go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I could get over that. The raw meat, like... The garlic will make it better. Don't worry. I don't know. I don't know, Mike. I, I, I tell you, I tried it, and um, it was it was interesting. If you like meat pudding, <laughs> it's kind of what it's like. Listen, there's probably a lot of Lebanese people listening right now that don't like their raw kitty being called meat I mean, pudding. Norwegians have lutefisk. That's like fish pudding. I'm Norwegian. So. You know what you didn't have, Scott? What you have? I think it's called Iraq, Mark. I, I might be wrong, but there's a drink that's meant to go with it. It's sort of like. Uh, uh, black liquor anisette and you mix it they, so you put it in front of you it's like equal parts I, there's ice water and this anisette liquor and you got to kind of like blend it together and that's meant to go with the raw kibbe so i don't think you got the full exposure scott i forgot about that um that that with the garlic adds another layer to it, it probably sterilizes everything probably what it does <laughs> uh, all right i mean since we you know since it's been an international theme if i had asked you guys for your favorite international food What's your favorite international genre of food? And Eric Peterson, barbecue is not international. That is United States. I don't know. I uh, I smoked a Mexican inspired pork butt over the weekend. I, of course, that, you did. Does that make it Mexican? I don't know. No, that makes it. That makes the taking Mexican food and making it Tennessee because you're smoking it. So no, but a fusion. The fusion. <laughs> do, you, do you have a favorite genre? Is it Mexican food? For me? Yeah. Mm, that's that's probably one of the family's favorites at the moment, I would say. Um, how about you, Mike? Probably Lebanese. Lebanese? Okay. Scott Bossman? Uh, I I mean pure Italian food. I love. Oh come on! I mean it's Mike, easy. Are you are you gonna are you gonna that's that's very like American? I like Greek. Food I'll, well. I'll 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 give you Greek. I mean, Mike, is Boston really getting like authentic Italian food in Onalaska, Wisconsin? No, but Look. I got it in Boston. Okay, I love it. okay. I'll, you know what? I apologize then. Yeah, I'm I mean, sorry. No, we went to the North yeah. End. We to the north yeah. end. It's authentic. That's, a, that's authentic. That's legitimate. Okay. <laughs> um, Tria? Uh, I have a Thai, Indian and Thai food. Those are my two favorites. Ooh. Okay. So you like to sweat when you eat. Oh, no. I don't need it that hot, but a little kick, but not super duper hot. Okay. I like I had in more than spicy. Yeah, I had Indian last week, and um, I said medium spice. Myself, my kids, we were sweating at medium. And I'm like, what would hot be? Yeah, it, it's extremely hot. I lived in the Middle East, and our cook was from, I can't remember what part of India, but we couldn't eat her. Like, our nose was running. It was dragon hot. So it, it can get a lot hotter. Too much. Wow. Um, okay. And Tate, how about you? Uh, I like I like Thai food a lot. Um, I like Mexican food. I can't go wrong there. And uh, sushi. You know, sushi is Japanese, obviously. So that would be it for me. But I don't know. I, I like it all, man. I mean, if it looks good, I'll eat it. If it smells good, bring it on. I mean, I'm not I'm not that picky. I just don't like kale. I won't do that. Yeah. Kale? I don't yeah. do that. No, I don't do kale. 
at all? No. I'll eat anything except kale. It's just not, it's not what? for me. Will they let you into Lululemon now if they're listening to this? Uh, probably not. No. Not no, I don't do kale. Like, I mean, it's, there's a list, a very short list of things that I don't eat. And kale is on the top of it. It's just gross. It's like rabbit food to me. And it is not something that, you know, I need to eat. It's just not spinach? for me. Eat spinach? I like spinach. Yeah, absolutely. How about the tortoises? Even, do even like my the tortoises kale? won't eat kale. No. So it's a lich food thing. Like we don't eat that stuff. Got it. Got it. But you like Thai. So that makes you cool. Yeah, Girl. yeah, yeah. I like Thai a lot. Mark and I, we we put the hurt on some Thai food occasionally. And, uh, I tell you, you know what? Speaking of, like for boot camp in August, we are going to the best Thai restaurant, arguably in the United States. It's okay. Anthony Bourdain's favorite place. Yeah. Lotus, oh, Lotus of Lotus. Siam. Lotus of Siam. No, but Mark, I was listening. I was listening to the radio and um, Bacchanal. Uh, the Bacchanal Buffet is opening back up, I think, this month now. And during the pandemic, they dumped an insane amount of money into it. And they're going to have, you know, themed plates. And it's supposed to be even better than it was pre-pandemic. So uh, mm. might, we're going to need to do that one night again. All right. I'm in. I'm in. Yeah, it was it's it's, last it's nice to see that Vegas is coming back. Is I think the whole back. world is the whole world coming back. I, I don't I don't watch the news anymore. I couldn't tell you what's going on in the world. I, I don't know. I mean, I just see more airplanes in the sky coming into Vegas every day, so that's a good thing. That's the U.S. Good. is coming back, I think. The yeah. U.S. is coming back. All right. Well, well, my three favorite genres are going to be Thai, Japanese, and Indian. Oh. For sure. So. Great. Um, but Greek is really good, too. I mean, it's hard to. It's, you know, and Lebanese is really good. They're all really good. Yeah. I don't know. Hard you, know it's, you know, what's so funny is like, no one's like, 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 if this was like an international podcast, you would hear it and be like, boy, I love those hamburgers and hot dogs in the United States. We went out the other day <laughs> to the Wiener Schnitzel. <laughs> we got fries. <laughs> It was great. I haven't had heartburn like that in years. It was glorious. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I thought this was a, a fun podcast. I want to thank the listeners for putting up with our shenanigans and remind them that if you are getting some value of it, do us three favors. Follow us, rate, review the podcast, send us a screenshot at support at the We're going to send for free the $97 wholetailing course how to double your money, 30 days or less. All right. Are we good? Good. All right. Let's let's do this. One, two, three. Let's uh, freedom, freedom ring. ring. Not bad. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Start your journey at www.thelandgeek.com and www.scotttaub.net. Read and review the podcast and email support at thelandgeek.com. Your screenshot for a free passive income launch kit.